I now give the floor to His Excellency Robert Doucet, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Regional Integration and Togolese Abroad of Togo. Mr. President of the 77th Session of the General Assembly of the United Nations, ladies and gentlemen, heads of state, of government, and delegations, Mr. Secretary General of the United Nations, ladies and gentlemen, after the unprecedented format of our General Assembly, the formats in the wake of uh, the coronavirus pandemic and the constraints related thereto, we now are united under the same roof to engage in a calm discussion of the problems that are upending our lives and the lives of those in this world. The goal is to place our shared organization on track to uphold the values and principles, the basic values and principles that have been undermined by geopolitical rivalries, attempts at domination, national issues, and conflict. I wish to take this opportunity to applaud the theme that has been chosen for the general debate for this session, a watershed moment, transformative solutions to interlocking challenges. However, before pursuing this statement, I wish to first warmly congratulate you, Mr. President, on your election to the presidency of our 77th General Assembly and we wish you every success. I can assure you of uh, the support of the Togolese delegation. I also wish to applaud the efforts of your predecessor and the work that has been achieved under very difficult circumstances. On behalf of the President of the Republic of Togo, President Foroso Zima Glasime, a warm tribute to the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, for his many initiatives to make our organization more efficient. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, on this 77th, in its 77th years of existence, the United Nations has indefatigably endeavored to achieve conflict prevention and uh, ensure the maintenance of international peace and security. Presently, the threat looming over the peace has meta metastasized. Interstate conflicts of the past have been compounded by and succeeded by new forms of violence with the involvement of elusive stakeholders. Africa had once been shielded and has now become a sanctuary of terrorist groups. The terrorist threat had long been confined to countries of the Sahel has spilled over into coastal states of the Atlantic and West Africa. For this reason, the President of the Republic of Togo, His Excellency Mr. Far Sozima Nasimbe, has ceaselessly personally endeavored to ensure peace and stability in West Africa, specifically in the Sahel region. This determination has allowed the President of the Republic as a mediator in the crisis between the two brotherly countries, Cote d'Ivoire and Mali, to secure the release of three Ivorian soldiers of the 46 remaining ones. And I wish to take this opportunity to call on all parties to exercise patience and restraint in order to allow mediation to bear fruit. Recent terrorist attacks have claimed civilian casualties, have caused significant material damage in the north of Togo. This stands as a testament to the increasingly sophisticated means being used by jihadists. This is an alarming situation, 
and is of great concern to our delegation. For this reason, we welcome the consensual adoption on 29 July 2022 of the annual progress report of the Working Group on Digitization in the Context of International Security and National Security. Togo remains steadfastly determined to combat and to drive these criminals out of our borders. And in this regard, we shall never waver. In view of providing our contribution to this overriding goal, Togo, on 23 and 24 March 2022, Togo hosted the first Pan-African Summit on Cybersecurity held in Lome. The Lome Declaration, an outcome of this summit, reflects the commitment to combating cyber threats. In this regard, Togo welcomes the work underway at the Ad Hoc Committee to elaborate a comprehensive international convention on countering the use of ICTs for criminal purposes and encourage all stakeholders to engage in in the, the establishment of such a legal instrument. Beyond the military response, we are fully cognizant of the fact that the fight against terrorism is also linked to the degree of trust between the army and the population, as well as uh, between the latter and the government. For this reason, we continuously seek to counter the causes of the spread of violent extremism which fuels terrorism. In this way, Togo has adopted innovative, multi-sectoral measures which are set out in our strategic document on countering violent extremism, which is adopted on 1 July 2022. In this vein, an emergency program for the Savan region with uh, 9,104,704 U.S. dollar allocation was set aside for the implementation of numerous projects by 2025 in the sectors of water, energy, health care, infrastructure, education, and agriculture. We are at a new stage in this asymmetric war against the terrorist cell. The deterioration of the security situation should be of concern to all of us, first and foremost to the United Nations. Uh, that having been said, there is an important need to fully revitalize our organi organization and to spare no effort to achieve reform of the Security Council. I wish to take this opportunity to applaud the global program on countering terrorist threats against vulnerable targets of which my country, Togo, is a beneficiary as a pilot country. This United Nations program is geared towards building the capacities of member states and for, to provide them with logistical, logistical support for the protection of vulnerable targets in the face of terrorist attacks. And this has revealed itself to be of tremendous importance for our country. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, and the other major challenge faced by humanity is climate change. All expert reports on this matter are alarming. This phenomenon is all the more concerning given that it indiscriminately affect, afflicts all countries in the world, and unfortunately this includes non-polluting countries, including ours, Togo. Togo has adopted a robust policy for restoration of vegetation with an ambitious program for the green transition. 
the Togolese government has adopted a firm commitment to sustainable management of natural resources and for resilience in the face of climate change consequences. For sustainable management and protection, therefore, our government has focused our priorities, amongst other things, on improvement of marine and coastal ecosystems, regulation of fishing, and promotion of the blue economy. Uh, with respect to preservation and restoration of ecosystems and combating desertification, Togo has launched a significant national program for reforestation of one billion trees by 2030, prohibited the import, trade, and use of glyphosate and all products containing it, as well as for the promotion of the use of biopesticides and biofertilizers in our country. We ardently hope that the next COP27 to be held, of course, on the 7th to the 18th of November 2022 in Egypt, that, the, that it will help to genuinely place back at the heart of international priorities the preservation of the environment by incentivizing stakeholders to honor their financing pledges, which are necessary to tackle global warming and climate change. On the subject of renewable energies, Togo has forged strategic partnerships for the provision of reliable, modern, and lowest-cost services in rural areas. The Access Fund for Electricity to All, called the Tinga Fund, the CISO Fund, and the provision of solar energy kits for rural and vulnerable populations, photovoltaic plants, mini solar centers and solar street lights have been installed throughout our country, resulting in widespread use of renewable energy in Togo. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, at the economic and social level, Togo has adopted a government roadmap for the period up until 2025. The vision therein is to make Togo a modern nation with inclusive and sustainable growth. This roadmap includes three key pillars, namely greater inclusion and social harmony, guaranteeing peace, turbocharging job generation by harnessing the forces of the economy and modernizing the country by shoring up these st its structures. The reforms in the business climate has allowed Togo to significantly enhance its foreign direct, foreign direct, direct investments in the country. Likewise, greater cooperation uh, for development has contributed to greater mobilization of external resources in light of the new momentum generated by the adoption of the government roadmap and its embrace by development actors, as well as the creation of new partnerships and the dynamization of existing partnerships. The overriding challenge for Togo is to establish and to shore up its national bedrock and social protection, improvement of access for people to basic social services, and strengthening of um, inclusion mechanisms are also of key significance for the reduction of poverty. To achieve this, the government has incorporated the principle of leaving nobody behind in public policies. In this way, other initiatives innovative initiatives have facilitated progress in the inclusion process of all social categories, such as the adoption of the law establishing universal health care and the digital platform, which we call WEZU. This was established in 2021 to provide treatment for pregnant 
women and newborns with a view to reducing maternal and neonatal mortality. Greater protection for women against discrimination and gender-based violence and mitigation of socio-cultural burdens have significantly improved the contributive capacities of women and girls in our country's development. Togo has adopted a financial inclusion mechanism uh, for the most vulnerable groups in our population through monetary transfers. We've established a development project for social networks and basic services as well for social nets and basic services as well as a support project for vulnerable people. Furthermore, an incentive mechanism for agricultural financing based on risk sharing is an, and a structuring project to improve agricult rural agricultural training and integration have also been established. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, I should like to invite everybody to consider the bases of multilateralism and the objectives sought by the Founding Fathers when they envisaged this global governance system. During the 75th session of our General Assembly, we engaged in a lengthy discussion here at the United Nations about, and uh, we wish to reaffirm our commitment to multilateralism. Uh, an important declaration was adopted and during the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. This aptly reflects the new multilateral ambition which we have embraced, an ambition which we hope to see more just and equitable and to show us that we are the engines of the global development and growth that is sustained. Today, we are called upon to adopt concrete measures to tackle the plethora of challenges which weaken our world, inter alia terrorism, security challenges, not to mention COVID-19. However, unfortunately, we cannot but note, but far too often we trample upon our multilateral commitments. At times we strip them of all of their meaning, their strength, their roots. Ladies and gentlemen, how else can we understand the fact that the Security Council of the United Nations remains so exclusive. Why not work in good faith towards reform of this important organ of the international security system by making it more reflective of present day international realities? Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, after this analysis, we come to the following conclusions. Today, we are convinced that African countries or Africa in general no longer wish to align themselves with great par uh, powers regardless of who they may be doing due to the uh, shortcomings of the concept and the failure of the concept of multilateralism. The role assigned to Africa in the 21st century reflects the image that some powers still hold vis-a-vis -vis our continent, seeing it has exclusively their zone of influence. Africa has almost no impact on the current global order, and yet Africa endures the devastating consequences of upheavals of international society. Africa, in the eyes of certain powers, is only of interest when they are finding themselves in difficulty. There's a need to consider 
the role of Africa and the place that Africa holds and the internet on the world stage. Today, Africa no longer holds the place that it deserves on the international stage. For a number of powers, Africa as a continent does not have a role to play as a major actor in the Kantian uh, sense on the, inter on the world stage. They think they live in the same world at a time when the world has changed profoundly, when the United Nations was created in 1945, except for, with the exception of two African countries, which we all know, Liberia and Ethiopia, the countries of Africa were not yet independent. After 77 years, it is the same international system, unfortunately, which persists owing to the will of the five permanent members of the Security Council, who we all know. Although the integration, African integration project is still a work in progress, a consensus has been reached between African states at the level of the African Union, as was recalled during the 77th session, this session, by the President of Senegal, uh, President of the African Union, vis-a-vis -vis the need for the continent to secure two permanent seats at the Security Council, in addition to two non-permanent seats for African states. Despite this general consensus, of 54 African states, the reluctance of certain members of the P5, the reluctance to see Africa occupy this place, stands in stark relief. Unfortunately, the voice of Africa seems not to be heard because some simply do not wish to see Africa be a strong continent. The great powers wish to boil Africa down to a pure instrumental, purely instrumental entity for the service of their causes and they cl clearly do not wish to see Africa play an important role, a key role in the world. They frequently endeavor to prompt and encourage Africans to stick to their narrative and ultimately Africans usefully are, sur are, are, are used to support one side against another. When the discussion turns to voting on a resolution at the Security Council, we are actively solicited on both sides. Africa is often courted, even subject to pressure by some of its partners. These mindsets and actions are anachronistic. They take shape in a historic context where Africa has become cognizant of its own responsibility when Africa increasingly speaks in a single voice. The fractures of the colonial era between an Africa that is said to be French-speaking, Portuguese-speaking, Arabic-speaking, English-speaking, etc., have dwindled, as have the post-Cold War ideologies that dominated throughout the second half of the 20th century. Today, Africa wishes to remain Africa. Africa and African-speaking Africa, if I may put it that way. Present-day Africa is not the Africa of 1945, certainly not the Africa of the 1960s. Today in Africa, we have a plethora of new partners who are an integral part of the new international geopolitical landscape, a far cry from the two anachronistic blocks that structured the world in the post a war 20th century. The world has shifted toward multipolarism. To paraphrase Blaise Pascal, the world has become a whole whose center is both everywhere and nowhere. And Africa cannot 
and will no longer be a carriage of a single locomotive. Many African countries today, in truth, are very much entwined and no longer entwined in terms of regimentation by they are no longer linked and bound by colonial history they are very much keen to work with new partners all of these changes linked to history itself are and the perpetual future but also the patent will to adopt a, par a, par a paradigm shift in terms of cooperation in Africa and this should prompt certain powers to adopt a software change so to speak if they wish to continue to work with the Africans there is a challenge for a shift in mindset a shift in conduct among our partners without exception uh, they look towards Africa with agendas that are dictated by their own interests. Africa now expects more equality, respect, equity, and justice in its relationships and partnerships with the rest of the world, with the great powers, regardless of who they may be. Today, the Africans wish to be real partners for the rest of the world. In the Concert of Nations, there is a need for Africa to be heard, for dialogue to have a purpose. The inability to listen perverts the purpose of dialogue, morphing it into a juxtaposition of monologues, partial reasonings, at times in the guise of pseudo-multilateralism, whose danger resides in the distortion of the relationship and yet in today's world it is only by pooling our intelligence that we can reach agreement on the goals to be achieved together although the essential issues of our time remain unchanged the understanding of the same issues diverges when one considers the South, when one considers the North on the major international issues. Listening to African voices cannot be a simply an adjustment in discussions. Africa certainly doesn't have the same megaphones that the great powers of the world do. However, the voice of Africa counts, and it needs to count if we wish to see Africa as a partner on the major international issues. In the meantime, Africa expects a genuine partnership, and our allies need to make an effort to embrace the spirit of this kind of a partnership. Our allies cannot each time secure the unconditional support of Africa. Africa wishes to cooperate with its allies on the basis of issues including our interests being taken into account to achieve this. There is a need for our partners to abandon the fancies that were largely forged in the 19th and 20th century and they are clearly dissonant with the 21st century challenges, a century when national and regional challenges have global implications and global challenges have regional, national, even local consequences and ramifications, repercussion, economic repercussions and upheavals at the international level are direct consequences of the restoration of war in Europe and this bears that out. We are all, in truth, all facing the same challenges and threats which imperil our survival and our existence. However, we firmly believe that we can build a prosperous world, more stable and more secure and safe for our people 
through enhanced and efficient and revitalized multilateralism. To that end, we have a single choice to, under the aegis of the United Nations, to restore strength and determination in our collective capacity for dialogue, resilience, and solidarity to help us make our planet once again habitable for all and together and in a sustainable way to build the world which we share. We can, and this is something which we believe very sincerely, we can read the founding text, learn to respect and consider the smallest, the weakest, and the most vulnerable. Yes. We believe that another world is possible. We are all condemned in that regard. And here, once again, I will paraphrase the eminent Albert Einstein on the subject of war. I do not know how the Third World War will be fought, but I know there will not be much of a world to see the fourth. I thank you. I thank the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Regional Integration and Togolese Abroad.